momentarily. Those of you with cell phones, we ask that you please turn them off or place them on vibrate. The family, the immediate family, will be seated here to my left. And we have an overflow for this one row here if there's any family in the rear that needs to come forward. There is no standing. If you do not have a seat, we are asking that you exit the chapel. If there is no room upstairs in the overflow, we do apologize, but we do have to maintain safety and follow directions for the CDC for COVID. Please be sure that you have a seat. There is no standing in the chapel. Service will begin. God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, 
Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely, surely, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the promise that keeps us now during these days. On behalf of Jolie, Grant, Gabriel, Gigi, and their extended family, we welcome you. We thank you for your support we thank you for your love. We thank you for the way you have embraced the family. At the appropriate time, Jolie will extend words of appreciation and gratitude to you for all that you've done for them. I want to say a personal note of thank you to the officers of this church. Cleveland was not a member of this church having his name on the book. But you could not tell anybody that he did not belong to this church. Sat over here to my right. And whenever he came into church, all six feet, five or six, you knew Cleveland was in the house. It was my privilege to baptize his eldest son, Grant, in this church. It was Pastor Olivier's privilege to baptize Gabriel just about six weeks ago. Cleveland was here. Their children were blessed in this church. Jolie's father, is a retired Seventh-day Adventist pastor, wonderful Christian man. Amen. It, it breaks our heart that he, he is not here with us today in person. I never met Jolie's mom, never had the privilege, but everyone that I have spoken with had nothing but the highest praise and affection for her. So Jolie, Grant, Gabriel, Gigi, we are here for you today. I pray God will bless you. And I pray that this service will be dignified, dignified. We have spent hours on end putting the program together. I, all the way from Huntsville, Alabama, working on the program. So the program is as Jolie wants it. And as one of my professors used to say, Dr. Thompson, Pastor Olivier, one of our professors, Elder C.T. Richards used to say, no deviation from strict integrity will meet God's approval. Let me paraphrase that today. No deviation from the program will meet my approval. I have come all the way from Huntsville. I've left a sick granddaughter at my house. Flew in last night on the way here. We were diverted from Nashville. In fact, let me back up. At 10 o'clock yesterday morning, I had a doctor's appointment. Left my house at 11.30. And there are two members of the church who are aware of my travels. We're online most of the way. 
drove to Nashville, Tennessee, jumped on a flight. Halfway mid-air, the flight was di diverted because there were problems landing at LaGuardia. So we ended up in Baltimore, Washington. And after a while, we finally got to New York. And here I am. So I did not come to entertain you. I have come to officiate. So let me repeat, no deviation from the program will be met with my approval. I am a retired pastor. Nobody pays my salary. So I am obligated to no one but God. So work with us. Now, having said all of that, let me say this, to put it in context, we have to be finished in an hour and 15 minutes to get to Pine Lawn. So whatever you have to say, cut off some of the front, cut off the bottom, and set fire to the middle. And may God bless you as our program continues as outlined. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. When things go bad, we have a friend in Jesus. We're going to sing this hymn this morning. What a friend we have in Jesus. We'll ask the audience to stand, the family to remain seated as this song is sung. Ellen Ahmad. What a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry Everything to God in
heads bow as we pray. Indeed, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins, our griefs to bear. Today, Lord, our griefs are many as we come together to grieve with this family. Today, Lord, a son is looking to you with questions in his mind as he wonders why. A daughter, Lord, is looking to you. She wonders why, Lord. A mother, a wife, is looking to you, Lord. A congregation of friends and well wishers are looking to you. And we ask the question, why, Lord? Well, Lord, a long time ago, in your words, you did reveal why. In that Garden of Eden, you did say to Adam and Eve, why? But it still bothers us today, Lord. Each time a loved one goes to sleep at the cruel land of death, the question still comes, why, Lord? But you promise that you will be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You promise, Lord, that you will be our father. And even though you dwell in heaven, you saw it fit to step down to earth so that we could have life and abundant life. So, Lord, Though we have questions, we pray that you will help us to trust you that in your own sweet time, you will give us all the answers we need. I pray that you will comfort this family today. And may our gathering here today to show support and our love overflow upon them today in a special way. And I pray that as they ask their question, they will look to the only one who can supply the answers, Jesus Christ, their father and their friend. And in yet lonely hours, Lord, we pray that when all else is silent, that they will hear your voice speaking, words of comfort and words of love. Be with the proceedings today, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord will be found in Psalms 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, will we not fear, though the earth be removed, Though the mountain be carried into the depths of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, there is a river, the stream whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen rage, the kingdom were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melt. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolation he hath made in the earth. He maketh the war to cease until the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathens. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge and the people of the Lord say amen. amen. I said the people of the Lord say amen. amen. Bless you. 
Please remain standing for the prayer of comfort, after which you will be seated. Let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the life of Cleveland. We are so grateful, Father, for what his union that you ordained has produced. So, Lord, we are thanking you for Jolie, praising you for Grant, for Gabe, for Gigi. Lord, in a special way right now, they need your presence. And we are not ashamed to come before you, for you have said in your word, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Father, we see Jesus throughout scripture, that he attended weddings, and he also attended funerals, which means that whatever moment we are in our life, God is present. And Father, there wasn't a funeral that you did not crash and turn into a rebirth celebration. So Father, we are claiming your word that when you come again, there will be a rebirth and we shall see Cleveland. We look forward to that great reunion. But until then, we pray the special prayer of comfort over the Woods family, that you will take them in the palm of your hands, that you will hold them close to your heart and allow them to understand that whatever hole they now feel can be filled abundantly with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Father, help them to continue to live the legacy. Strengthen them, guide them, replenish them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Allow me just to say a few words to my Jolie and the G unit. Oh, thank you. You, you guys, um, you don't know, I have the privilege to be uh, the pastor the most recent pastor. So I come today in two capacities. So first, allow me to do my first capacity as a conference official, uh, as the youth director of the Northeastern Conference. I bring you greetings from President Abraham Jules, Executive Secretary Dr. Eldine King, and our conference treasurer, Robert Chandler. We come in support of the family, but I wanna talk to you as your pastor. And let me be real with you. I know I, a couple of weeks ago we had my farewell Sabbath, but I need you to know, G unit, I don't believe in former pastor. I am your pastor. Pastor Mounter is not your former pastor. He is your pastor. Pastor Thompson is not your former pastor. He is your pastor. We are your pastors. You will never leave our hearts. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that this family is an awesome and incredible family. That Jolie is, I think, one of the greatest children's ministry leaders I have ever met. Let the church say amen. When pandemic hit, it did not stop her. She mobilized her team to pour into the children of the church, whether virtually. And I want you to know that the kids would say anything off the wall and Jolie would never be phased. She knows how to handle all that energy. Grant gave Gigi, I was at the investiture, got to baptize you. I want you to know I'm here for you. I love you guys dearly. And whenever you need me, just give me a call. You have my number. I'm only 20 minutes away, but I want you to know when my dad died a couple of years ago unexpectedly, it was hard. But what I learned from that experience is to live the legacy he wanted me to live. Every time I did something that I knew he would be proud of, it was like he was with me all over again. So you have that opportunity. Live the legacy that he wants you to live. 
and he will never leave you. God bless you. I love you. This time I'm going to ask Aaliyah Woods and Ashley Jones to come forward. And then we will continue up until our special music by Mark Prentice. And then you'll hear thereafter how the program proceeds. Aaliyah Woods and Ashley Woods can come forward. Good morning, everyone. We will be reading my uncle's obituary today for Cleveland Woods. Cleveland Woods III was welcomed into the world by his proud parents, the late missionary Claudia and Pastor Cleveland Woods Jr. on August 23rd, 1965 in Brooklyn, New York. Cleveland was the seventh child born to his parents' union. He was dearly loved on this earth. However, on Thursday, October 28th, 2021, our Heavenly Father and his infinite wisdom decided that Cleveland's work was complete and he called him to rest. In his 56 years, he lived life to the fullest, giving little thought to himself, but to the uplifting and gratification of others. As a young boy growing up, he was inquisitive, an avid reader, lovable, humble, and a joy to be around. His early years were spent in Brooklyn, New York, where he received his primary education. It was during this time, his love of basketball became evident. It would later catapult his ongoing journey. For his stellar grades, he was accepted into Samuel, Samuel J. Tilden High School's prestigious law, politics, and community affairs program. Cleveland received a full basketball scholarship to New Hampshire College, now known as Southern New Hampshire University. During his undergraduate years, while playing basketball for SNHU, he was rewarded for the God-given talents he possessed as the only player in SNHU's history in fifth in New England Division II basketball to have more than 2,000 career points and 1,000 rebounds. He was dubbed the rubber band man for the ease with which he maneuvered his six foot five inch, 210 pound frame, the quiet assassinator. He was a two time All American in 1986 and 1987 and was inducted into the SNHU Athletic Hall of Fame in 1993. After graduating and receiving his bachelor's of science degree in business management from SNHU in 1987, 
He pursued basketball professionally and for several years played in Europe. Cleveland was a beloved superstar basketball player, leading his teams throughout his years, beginning with Kenny Kings and Tompkins, Brooklyn Pride, Tilden High School, and New Hampshire College with his draft to the international basketball team. Upon his return to Brooklyn, New York, his journey of giving back began when he was employed by the New York City Board of Education. He also continued to pursue his thirst for academic and professional growth. So he went on to continue his education at Adelphi University in Garden City, New York, where he received his master's degree in special education. While teaching in Queens at the Brooklyn Piccoli Middle School, Cleveland met the love of his life, graduate social work inter intern, Joliet Alicia Hall. The couple began a journey which started on February 20th, 2002, and lasted almost 20 years. To this union were born Grant Jordan, G1, Gabriel Blake, G2, and Giselle Alicia Louise, G3, whom he loved dearly. Cleveland was dedicated to his family, and each one of his children had their own weekly special time with their dad, which, in, which included conversations and life lessons. G1 had Sundays at the gym, G2 had pizza time, and G3 had lunch or dinner dates with daddy at IHOP. After working for the New York City Board of Education for several years, Cleveland went on to work at the Lawrence School District, where he was employed for over two decades. In the spring of 2014, Cleveland ventured into business with his longtime friend and colleague, Dove Fryer. Together, they started what is known today as All-in-One Athletics, where they touched, li touched, lives, touched the lives of many children and youth by merging intense basketball instruction and academics. Cleveland was an educator, coach, mentor, friend, and confidant. There are no words to convey the massive void of his departure. The compassion and touch of one solitary man can change the world, one life at a time. Cleveland was the third changed lives. He made a difference. Cleveland leaves phenomenal memories of a life well lived. Looking forward to his resurrection are his, life, uh, are his wife, Joliet, sons, Grant and Gabriel, daughter, Giselle, siblings, Julie Mae, Mary Ann, Patricia, Stephen deceased and his wife, Karen, Gwendolyn and her husband, Robert, Charles and his wife, Teresa, and Leonard. From the Hall family, one brother-in-law, Eric, and one sister-in-law, Tracy. He had a host of aunts and uncles, nieces, nephews, cousins, and many other beloved relatives and friends. Thank you. Our scripture reading comes to us from 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 through 18. And it reads as follows. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them who are asleep. They, that ye should not, sorry about that, let me start over. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which are asleep in Jesus will, bring, will, bring, will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that, we, that which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then, which, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall it be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another even with these words. May God add a rich blessing to the reading and understanding of his words. Thank you.
Amen, amen. He was like a tree planted by the rivers of water, who brought forth his fruit in his season, and whatever he did prospered. When I came to Ebenezer many years ago, I would always see this young, tall man with a shorter wife beside him, and at the time, one son who would later be joined by two siblings. Then the tall man became a more mature sort of youthful tall man who remained ever present with our church family. The tall young man blended in so well with our congregation, you'd never know he would only quickly pass in through and make in his impact. Whenever he passed through, it was always with the leisure of engaging the deep conversations and always about positivity and change. He had a passion for youth and ministry. His greatest passion was always about helping the youth, especially the young black men, on how to make positive life-changing decisions. Cleveland Woods used basketball as his tool to connect with and impact the young men of our community and beyond. Many children from our church participated at some point or another in his basketball camps and even in the parties he held at the gym to celebrate the children on a whole. Cleaver never limited himself to his three biological children. His quiver was always full of them. The children's ministry team here at Ebenezer has been blessed to be led by the family that is committed to children. That is Cleveland's family. Cleveland would be present wherever the children were, and he would just not be a bystander. He told stories in person during vacation Bible school and on Zoom. He even became the tech guy. He was always present and accounted for at simple or menial events like our annual barbecues, as well as other special events. When you think of the potential impact of the word positivity, you saw Cleveland as an epitome of what that looks, feels, and smells like. Our gentle giant is never going to be seen coming around here anymore, towering around us. We will never have barbecue feasts and see him hanging around us here anymore. We will miss his smile. We will miss his laughter. But if we remained faithful, we will reunite on that great getting up morning where we will never part again. So today, the Ebenezer Church family wishes to remind you, Jolie, Grant, Gabriel, G Giselle, that the life of one we love is never lost. Remember, your husband and father's influence goes on through all the lives he has ever touched. Although a light from our household is gone, a voice we love is stilled. A place is vacant in our hearts. Jolie, Grant, Gabriel, Gigi. Take courage in Psalm 147, verse 3. God heals the brokenhearted and binds up the wounds. We are here for you. Don't remember that. Each step of the way, stay comforted. At this time, we're going to be going through to the tributes for the family and from the friends. Please be reminded of our time limit. So you're going to come forward and a podium has been set up for you right here on my right that you will come forward. You can line up to the side so you can move quickly as your names. We have Mary Woods, Gwendolyn, Charles, Natalia, and then from our friends, we have Dover, Joy, Gary, and Caroline. You will come in that order and the microphone is right here.
Good morning. This is my tribute to my brother, Junior. I'm one of Cleveland's oldest, older siblings, his sister, Gwen. The following scripture gives me comfort. I will lift up mine eyes until the hills, until, until the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. That's Psalms 121. Today is a difficult day. I am deeply saddened by the great loss of my loving brother, Junior. Some call him Cleveland, some call him Cleve. He will always be Junior to me. Two years ago, I was in New York saying goodbye to my older brother, Steve. Today, I'm back in New York saying goodbye to my baby brother, Junior. I had to write this down so I didn't forget it. I was fortunate to attend one of Junior's basketball tournaments on my last visit to New York. I was filled with pride as I watched him in all his glory. He was coaching and teaching and doing what he loved most. Family has always come first with Junior. He was a proud husband, a dedicated father to his children. We talked about his family, the plans he had for his children, and how he prepared for their future. We shared family stories, pictures, and lots of laughter over the airways. I'm truly going to miss his smiling face, who enjoyed eating food, especially my fried chicken and macaroni and cheese, whenever possible. I will always love and remember your beautiful, full of life spirit until we meet again, my brother. In closing, I'd like to say, I, um, looking at this crowd, I want everyone under the sound of my voice to know that Junior and the man that he was, had become was due to the foundation instilled in him by his parents, Cleveland and Claudia Woods, so many years ago. Thank you again. And thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm one of Cleveland's older sisters, and there lies one of the children that I never had, my confidant, my friend, and my baby brother. But I'd like to first speak to um, I call them by their middle names, Jordan, Blake, and Giselle. You three were your father's greatest joys. Everything that he did was because of you and your mom. He loved you to pieces. Somebody please let me know when I get to one minute because I, I can sometimes talk and I'm a little bit nervous, so I don't want to go over. I want to be in compliance. Um, <laughs> um, um, Jordan and Blake and Giselle remain friends. You, your best friends are the three of you and your mother. If you have any questions, anything that you want to know, ask. Don't be wondering and don't ask the wrong people. When I look at you, my brother lives on. And when you look at us, I hope that you see him as well. We have each other's numbers and let's stay in touch. Is that a minute? Okay, the next minute is for everyone under the sound of my voice. I want to say thank you for the role you played in my brother's life. You are all friends, and I'm sorry, you're all family. And the reason why is because family are friends. You, I'm sorry, the other way around, excuse me. Friends are family members that you make for yourselves. So he was very blessed to have all of you as family that he chose from his heart. So I thank you for the role you played in his life and remember him and his legacy by doing a couple of things. Number one, always be kind. Always be kind. If um, his friend Darren used to say, would you rather be kind or right? Cleveland always chose kindness. Um, if you can help someone, please do so. By doing that, you play forward what he gave to you. And finally, what he, will, what he will want us all to do now is to embrace his three children and his wife. They have a long road ahead of them without him. But if we all band together, let them know that they are not alone, my brother, our brother would be very, very pleased and his living will not have been in vain because it doesn't matter how, it doesn't matter the longevity what matters is the quantity 
And so, okay. I just heard, I just heard that I had a minute. I'm done. <laughs> okay. Hello. Um. How blessed am I to be able to call Cleveland Woods my uncle and godfather? Two pivotal roles that would have everlasting effect on my life. I would consider him my gentle giant with a heart of gold, who many knew and plenty loved. As you know, my uncle slash godfather was amazing when around him you were guaranteed a smile, laugh, tears from laughter, or any knowledge he was able to pass down. Yeah, I know if he was around him, his educational methods never turned off. Um, the last time I saw him was in June of this year for my mom's birthday. I cooked dinner and he told me, you're going to make someone a happy wife, followed by a kiss on the forehead. It's truly heartbreaking knowing that he won't be able to share that special moment with me. But I couldn't be more honored. Yeah. Thank you. I couldn't be more honored that I have so many moments with this exceptional man. And it, most, it makes this moment even harder knowing I will never hear him say, I love you, Nisi Poo, again. I love you so much, and I hope you know that you meant the world to me. Hi, I'm Doug Fryer, a uh, friend of Cleveland. For the past few weeks, people have been reaching out to me from all avenues of Cleveland's life. The most common question of all is, how did he die? And while that curiosity exists, I prefer to talk about how he lived. <sighs> Cleveland was simply the most positive person I have ever met in my life. He operated and existed in this world based on faith. If someone wronged him or did not honor a commitment, his response was, well, they meant well. <laughs> <laughs> when I couldn't figure out why my students didn't do their work, he had to answer. They weren't blessed with as much as your parents blessed you with. When a customer stopped sending their kid to our camp, he replied, they always come back. Most of the time, he was correct. If you... If you ever had the pleasure of sharing a meal with Cleveland, it sounded like the first time he had ever eaten a meal. <laughs> the, amount, the amount of, mm, this is good, <laughs> was nearly unlimited. I consider Cleveland to be my best friend. But then after talking to so many people and reading so many posts on social media, I get the impression that many people can make that same claim. That's just how we made everyone feel. He had that way about him. At camp, a large percentage of the time, I would be filming him interacting with players and coaches while running drills. In retrospect, I wish I had, I wish I had the camera on him 100% of the time so that I could get just one more bit of his knowledge, one more spark of his energy and passion one more glimpse into his ability to make everyone feel welcome and special. As I reflect now, I'm glad that I have so many moments that I can replay on YouTube, Facebook, yeah, even TikTok. <laughs> I had a lot of crazy ideas for commercials, and Cleveland went with every one of them and never told me no, Dove, that was too crazy. <laughs> Some of our players have asked, how can they go on? He simply meant that much to them. I answer that question the same way I explained it to my daughter, Brianna. 
Every time you pick up a basketball from now on, you are celebrating Coach Wood's life and the passion that he had for the game. I find myself picking up a ball every day now as well. Jolie, Grant, Gabe, Giselle, I have a basketball for each of you to help you, help you keep them in your hearts forever. Thank you. I'm a college classmate and teammate of Cleveland Woods from 1983 is when I first met him. I got to say, myself, and there's another gentleman in the back here the year, and then most of our team is here as well. The people from school, as New Hampshire College, Southern New Hampshire University, our hearts go out, our thoughts and prayers go out to everybody. If we can do anything, please let us know. The laugh is always going to be there. The love's always going to be there. He's not going to be forgotten. We'll make sure of that. I broke this down into little tidbits. The best way for me to describe my relationship and, and fondness of Cleveland. September of 1983, arrived in New Hampshire, Manchester, New Hampshire. Myself, Eddie, is here in Cleveland. We had no idea where we were, although we went on recruiting visits. Cleveland sat down, met people from Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire. He spoke so fast <laughs> that they walked away just shaking their heads because they didn't know what he said. But they always came back. Right, the theme today was they always came back. His smile, his laugh, his embrace, they kept on coming back. Couldn't forget that. We would play music and dance and smile. I was a kid from one side of Brooklyn. He was a kid from a different section of Brooklyn. He shows up with blue suede shoes. I had to wear them. We switch flopped. Right? It was just a piece of him coming with us. It was priceless. As far as basketball goes, our first coach was very, very different. We ran. There were no limits on hours, right? He worked us. Suicides, which I watch on videotape, I watch Coach Woods practice, we would do. Cold walks up our campus hill at six o'clock at night in New Hampshire. The longest walk humanly possible. We all did it and he would sit there and just, why, why, why? Didn't understand. We made reference before of Sunday being a very special day for Cleveland. Our coach called practice on a Sunday freshman year. He meekly raised his hand and said, Coach, it's Sunday. I have to go to church. The response that he was given back was, Cleveland, this gym is my church. I'm Jesus. You're going to be here. And we were there. So with that, that journey began. Campus life, the thing that's been through and through with everyone we've heard, every reading we've heard, was he was welcomed and befriended and beloved by everyone. I've never heard anyone say a bad word about him. His smile, his embrace, it was infectious. It was there. We would sit in our cafeteria. We had our basketball table of 12 guys. Every day would have lunch. He would walk in from the back of the room. It would take 45 minutes for him to come across. <laughs> Students, teachers, professors, it didn't matter. Administrators, he stopped, said hello, and just spent some time. That's what he did. As far as his, his roommate, Eddie, and their room, Mr. Woods was not very neat. That was a disaster. What he portrayed away was very different. Our soccer, lacrosse, hockey, basketball teams, baseball teams didn't matter. He would walk in. He was part of that team. He, they were part of us. And that was, goes back to that infectious smile. Athletic successes. We saw these before. Two-time All-Americans, scoring rebound championship, regional championships. Through all of that and all his success, he never changed. He was warm-hearted, caring genuine and with that, that infectious smile, right? He went over to England, played professionally, played in South America, right? And then he goes to professional successes. For us at school, when we hear about his advanced degrees, we kind of scratch our head. That was not him when we knew him, right? <laughs> He's very special to go back and have that commitment to do those things. And we can laugh about that, right? We talked about influential educator, right? I think it was a dean of discipline in school, which again is amazing because he didn't want to do anything that our coach told him to do, right? Cleveland and Dove start all in athletics, not only in trains elite athletes, but what they do with other children in general is absolutely spectacular. It's a special place in his heart and your heart to do that. Don't stop that. That's important. In closing, I'm stuck. Why him? I don't know. I can't answer that, and I'm going to struggle with that. 
I love that man. We love that man. All I ask from everybody is in here, thoughts and prayers with the family. You'll always be with us. You're part of our family. You're always going to be around. We love you. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. My condolences to the Woods family, to Jolie, and to the children. Words cannot express what I felt when I got the news. I didn't call him Gle Cleveland, I called him Junior. He was Junior to me for over 40 some years. When I met Junior, he was playing the organ at Antioch Church. Junior was there and he was known to his mother as her baby. And she kept saying, my baby this and my baby that when I first came to Antioch. And I kept saying, she never brings her baby to church. <laughs> this lady keeps talking about her baby, but I never saw her baby. And one day we were in a conversation. I said something about her baby and she said, Junior is my baby. I said, that's your baby? <laughs> he was long legged Junior and he was no baby, but he was very special. For me, I had my daughter was born in Antioch Church, and as a very young child, as a toddler, she would scream. Every time Pastor Woods would get up to preach, she would just scream. I don't know if she didn't want to hear the word or what was happening, but she would scream. And the only person in the entire church that could calm her was Junior Woods. He would come and get her out of my arms and bring her to the organ and prop her up on the seat and she would remain silent for the rest of the service. So he had that in him from even a young person himself being very young. He had that way with children. And so to his children, no one could ever express what you would be going through today, but my prayers are continually with you and for you. I love the Woods family because I've been a part of this family for over 40 years. Elder Cleveland Woods was my father in the gospel. I will never forget him. I will not forget his labor of love, his teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I will never forget when he stood wholeheartedly that he was not going to let Junior play basketball because he would not go on a Sunday. But somehow somebody talked him out of it to let Junior go. And so he would go on Sundays. But this family is a part of my family, is a part of my life. Jolie, I love you. I love the family. And I will keep you continually in my heart as you go through this time. God bless you. Thank you. Sundays. Hmm. That wasn't happening. He probably started playing ball on Sundays when he went to college. But through his high school years, when I first met him, Junior just started playing ball his junior year, high school. Sophomore year, maybe, and turned it around where he put in hard work. Became a high school All-American, All-City player. He did that, but he was not coming on Sundays. We had a big game in the citywide summer league. The coaches, my brother Warren, uh, Kenny Kings could attest to this too. You had to go talk to his mother just for him to play on your team. You couldn't just go and play, you had to go ask Ms. Woods, can he play on your team, period. But on that Sunday, they went to go talk to him. Cleveland ain't coming. Me and Darren go talk to her. She said, you and Darren centers. I said, no, no, no. <laughs> Cleveland is center, we need him. <laughs> Me and Darren are guards. She was like, he's not going. We left, we just said. So we said, just pray for us that we could pull out this victory. But it wasn't so, because we didn't have Cleveland. But 
I'm here to say this. If you know Cleveland and love Cleveland, you had to know him and because he trusts his trust that he learned from Miss Woods, his loyalty that he got from being going to church. That was the kind of friend he was. His laughter and jokes. I mean, we could, I could have just had death in my family and Cleveland could cheer me up like one, two, three. Don't worry about it. Things going to be better. He just comes out with the saying, or, or he's lawyer, right? You can ask the judge Edwards, yeah. right? He's honest. You can ask the judge Shears because that's the kind of guy he was. He was big, but he was humble. Everybody called him all kind of names, but in high school, we called him the bear. <laughs> we called him the bear because he's like, oh, you're clean, you saw it. She said, yo, when you grab them rebounds now, just say, rah. So when he started doing that, the dudes was looking at him like, yo, this dude crazy. <laughs> but he put in that hard work because he wanted to go up against his brothers like Mo Sanford, them the big brothers. He wanted to go up against his big brother, Pipe. He put in that work so they couldn't rough him up no more. He was that kind of dude. So if you love Cleveland, if you love him as a teammate, stand up. If you love him as a faculty member, stand up. If you love him as a teacher, stand up. If you love him as family, stand up. Because it ain't no friends here. There's no friends here. We love you, Clee. We love you, Clee. We love you, Clee. G1, G2, G3, and Julie, to God be the glory for the life of Cleveland Woods. Thank you for sharing them with us. Thank you for sharing them with us. Thank you! Good afternoon. I'm going to be brief because I know time has spent. But um, I just want to um, talk about my baby brother for a second. I call him the legend. And I remember when he was young, and my father used to say to me, if you want to go outside, take Junior with you. Because he figured I'll come back at a decent time. But I used to tell Junior, take your ball with you. And I would leave him in the, in the, in the basketball court. And I used to say, I'll be right back. Don't go nowhere. <laughs> so no matter what time I came back, he was in that court playing basketball. <laughs> and he bounced that ball straight to college. And I'm proud of my baby brother. And I didn't think that he would leave me here, but a piece of my soul left. Yes, sir. I, don't, I always told him, be the dream. Don't live the dream, be the dream. Yes, sir. And it seems to me that he took my advice. I love him. I will always love him. That's good. Thank you all very much. Two weeks ago, Jolie sent a text about 11 o'clock that night to Pastor Olivier, Pastor Thompson, and I. And she said, Pastors, pray for my husband, Cleveland. They are taking him to the ER and I don't know what's wrong with my husband. But two hours later, I text Jolie. We all responded immediately. Two hours later, I text Jolie and I says, Jolie, any updates? What's happening? And her words, I shall never forget. It says, Pastor, he 
didn't make it. He didn't make it. The next morning I called Jolie. Grant was with her. And I said to Grant, Grant, today you became a man. Today, Grant, you are the man of the house. Let me tell you about Grant. These are the tributes to the family. And everything that was said, acknowledging the students, the Lawrence School teachers and students are here. Some of you are in the choir loft. Others are in the balcony. They are here to show their support. Grant, you did something for me and Gabriel that I shall never forget, Gigi. I spent three years pastoring this church from 2013 to 2016. And every Sabbath morning when I arrive, Grant would come and seek me out. And this is how he greeted me every Sabbath. Pastor, we pray for you every day. That's Grant. Grant, would you stand? Let's, let's affirm Grant. <laughs> Grant, turn around. Just turn around. And it was my joy to stand in the baptismal font right behind me and to baptize him. Pastor, po Pastor Olivia, come stand with me. Just about six weeks ago or so, Gabriel, would you stand, please? Gabriel, my wife is watching. Yes, let's, let's hear it. Let's put it together. It, it was a privilege to baptize Gabe on his birthday. And what's special for us is his birthday is the day before mine. So we share that together. Um, I love you, Gabe. God bless. Gigi? Stand up, sweetheart. Now, Pastor Olivier, I baptize Grant. Pastor Olivier baptize Gabriel. Pastor Thompson, come Pastor Thompson, come stand right here. Pastor Thompson and your grandfather dedicated you to the Lord in this church. Yes. And we are giving you permission today, the three of us. I'm speaking on behalf. I'm the older one. I'm the oldest. <laughs> I'm, I'm giving you permission today uh, that whenever it's your time to be baptized, I want you to call the three of us. And whoever the new pastor is going to be, <laughs> uh, we'll have to groom him <laughs> or her. We'll school that person. And let them know it's just, we just, you call us and all of us will be here for your baptism. Now, Grant, stand, Gabriel, stand. And, and I want to tell you something that your mom and dad did to drive my wife crazy. At our farewell, your mom and dad gave us a gift. And it's a globe with a golf ball and a tee. And I was out playing golf uh, on Thursday, two days, Monday. When I got home, my wife says to me, this thing is driving me crazy. She said, I found it, and I thought about Cleveland, and I've been trying most of the day to put the golf ball on the tee in this globe, and I just can't do it. Well, as a golfer, I says, I can do it. Let me try. And I felt embarrassed after about half an hour bouncing it it just wouldn't do. Point is, your dad is remembered 
we have something in our home, a globe. Julie, I don't know if you remember the globe. You do? It's a globe with a golf ball and a tee. And the trick is to set that ball on the tee. And whenever we are a little stressed and we pick up that globe, trying to fix it, we'll think of your dad. Gone, but never forgotten. We love you. God bless you. And we are all here for you. God bless you. Of the master's appearing Yet signs all foretell That the moment is nearing When he shall return Tis a promise most cheering But we know, we know not the hour there's light for the wise who are seeking salvation. There's truth in the book of the Lord's revelation. Each prophecy points to the great consummation. But we know, we know not the hour but he will come let us watch and be ready he will come oh yes hallelujah hallelujah he will come in the clouds of his father's bright glory but we know we know not the hour oh I want to be ready don't you want to be ready so we'll watch and we'll pray with our lamps trimmed and burning we'll work and we'll wait till the master's returning we'll sing and rejoice every omen discerning but we know we know not the hour but he His father's bright glory, but we know, we know not 
standing on the side and if you would like to join and sit in the choir loft we invite you to come and uh, be seated if you so desire I want to acknowledge the presence thank you I want to acknowledge the presence of Bishop Highsmith God bless you my brother appreciate your presence Pastor Thompson uh, Dr. Olivia, again, thank you so very much. We appreciate your presence here today. Would you bow your heads with me, Father? I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. I pray in your son's name. Amen. For the family, I want to let you know that Councilman Bruce Bakeman, Bokeman was here, but he had to leave. He just wants to let you know that he was here. I want to thank your cousin, Julie, for being here today. Julie, stand. I pastored Julie when I was pastoring in Huntsville, Alabama, almost 30 years ago. And now she and her husband are pastors in Atlanta, Georgia. Julie, God bless you. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Debbie, Debbie, would you stand, please? Um, uh, thank you for being here with your best friend, classmates from way back when. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Funerals are about the dead, but they are for the living. They're about the dead, but they're for the living. Jolie, I want to talk to you. And everybody else, you can listen in if you'd like. But I want to have a conversation, Jolie. You endeared yourself to me 
in ways that you will never know. For three years, I pastored this church. And on Wednesday nights, my wife and I would come, sit in the office. If anybody, the members knew, if you want to find us, we are in the office. Just come, open door, we'll chat. And, and most of the time, nobody showed up. Unlike Brooklyn, when I pastored down there. Always traffic. And even when nobody came, my wife and I would just walk out the church and go down to the mall and walk around and spend some money. But Jolie, you did something every Wednesday night. You'd come and you'd sit with us. You may take five minutes and talk about children's ministry, but most of the time, you just sat there with your pastor and his wife, and we fellowship. I'll never forget that. Never forget it. As a little boy, as a little boy, we were very poor. Didn't have much. Didn't have basically anything. Many days, I'd cry myself to sleep. I was hungry. And I'd say to my grandmother, Granny, I called her Nana. Nana, what's for food? What's to eat? And she would say this to me. Son, God will provide. And, and I grew up on that text. I think it was the first Bible text that I ever remembered. God will provide. What do you say to a wife? If you were in my place today, what would you say to a wife who's got three children? Grant is going to be 14 in, in two, three days. He'll be 14 years old. What do you say to a wife? You see, I, I could come here today and, and, and use some old sermon that preached well, got a whole lot of amens gravy sermons, but I want to talk to you today about the reality of where you are and where you're going. God will provide. So my grandmother would say to me, he'd provide. Many days I had no clothes. I had a pair of pants. It was my school pants. And I dare not wear it after school. I'd have to go in the house in those pants, stay in the house. And I'd go to school Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. My granny will take the pants and wash them, hang them on the line out there in South America, get dry. And my friends will go by and say, hey, Bob, come on out, let's play. And I'll stand by the window naked. And I'll say, I'm busy, I've got work to do. I was lying. I just didn't have clothes to go out. But my grandmother raised me on that text that God will provide. Three children. There was a lady who was a member of this church, and I baptized her in my ministry here. And last night I said to her, with your permission, I just want to say this. And she says, Pastor, you're going to make me cry. She says, that's why I'm not going to come, because I'll just cry. She says, but I'll come to your house tonight, and I'll see you before you leave in the morning. This lady's husband died and left her with four children. You know who she is. Some of you all know who she is. Her eldest was 17. Her next was 14. And she had twins, 11 years old. Left with four children. Today... Her eldest daughter is an administrator of a hospital here in Long Island. Her second daughter is a flight attendant. And the other two are doing very well. God will provide. Now, one of the challenges we have as preachers is every week we have to produce two sermons at least. One for Sabbath, Wednesday night, and if there's a funeral, there's a third. In my case, in Brooklyn, sometimes I had two or three funerals a week. 
And sometimes two in the same day, I had to produce. So I struggled putting those sermons together. And one of the things that we struggle with is getting the outline. Getting the outline. Not just getting up and talking, but getting that outline together and being true to the biblical text. Well, I found a story in the Bible that meets your need. In 1 Kings chapter 17, there's a famine in the land. And God says to his man Elijah, he says, I want you to go and hang out by the brook Cherith. He says, and I'm going to show you the kind of God I am. In the famine, you can drink by the brook. But not only that, in the famine, I'm going to provide you with two meals every day. Now, two meals every day is not so bad. As a boy, I didn't have that privilege. But two meals a day during a famine. And God, to show you what kind of God you serve, what kind of God we serve, he says, I'm going to get a raven. Now, if you understand a raven, those are greedy birds. Those are selfish birds. They don't share. But God says, I'm going to show you the kind of God you serve, Elijah. I'm going to feed you twice per day, and I'm going to give you the water by the brook. And God did just that. Two meals a day, God provided. The Bible says, but after a while... The brook dried up. But let me show you God's sense of humor. God says, arise. Arise, Elijah. And that's what I, I want to pause there for a moment. Jolie, there are going to be some days you will not want to rise up. There are some days, I'm telling you, my sister, my friend, my member... There's some days you're going to lie in that bed and you will not want to get up. You're going to hurt. You're going to hurt. I was on the road yesterday driving from Huntsville to Nashville. And I was going through this moment and I was crying. Thinking about my friend Jolie. I've been where you are. I, I want to be very transparent with you today. I want to be very honest with you today. When my granddaughter died, I shook my fist in the face of God. I stood by her bedside in Birmingham, Alabama. And I says, God, take me. I'm a sinner. This girl is only four and a half months old. She's not sinned. Take me instead. I bargained with God. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, in her benchmark book on grief, talks about the stages of grief. You, there's denial. Oh, no, this can't be happening to me. My baby is only 14. Gabriel is only 11. Gigi is only 8. God, this can't be happening to me. You start to bargain with God. You get angry at God. I was angry. I would not shave. Talk about a rise now. I did not shave. I wouldn't eat. I sat in my room. I didn't want to shower. I had no motivation, no desire. I was mad. And one day, my doctor, who was my golf buddy, Dr. Barry Brooks, Cleveland, Ohio, he says, Bob, let's go play golf. I say, I don't want to go play golf. He says, boy, something is wrong with you when you don't want to play golf for free. I'm paying. He said, I'm coming to your house. I'll take you to the course. He pulls up to my house, unshaven. He says, get in the car. Let's go. I go to the golf course and I hit a bad shot and I will yell, ah, you're stupid. You're the worst golfer in the world. And he walked up to me and he says, who are you? He said, I don't know you. He said, the Bob Mounter I know is the funniest guy on the golf course. He's got everybody laughing. If he hits a bad shot, he laughs. If you hit a bad shot, he says, who are you? He says, let me tell you something. You know my wife, Tanya, she's a, a Methodist pastor trained in Princeton. He says, talk to Tanya. And his wife called me up and she said words to me I shall never forget as long as I live. She says, Bob, it's not about your faith. It's about your heart. 
Jolie, there are going to be some days you will not want to get up. Grant will come into the room and he'll say, Mommy, what's wrong? Get up. Gabriel will say, Mom, get up. Gigi, wake up, Mom. Let's go. Time for school. You're going to have some good days. You're going to have some rotten days. Julie, your cousin, is leaving for Atlanta. Debbie is leaving to go back to Huntsville. I'm leaving in the morning. All these folk here today, the phone will stop ringing. The visits will become far and few. The cards that folk will give you with some money in it, hint, 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 <laughs> they'll stop showing up. And you will look at your three children. But Jesus said to Elijah, arise. Then, then, then watch, watch how Jesus operates. He says, now arise and go to Zarephath. He says, I have prepared not the woman with the big house or the woman with a lot of food. He says, I've prepared a woman who's a widow. She's, all, she's already lost her husband, just this woman and her son. And so Elijah shows up and the poor lady is standing there and, and, and she's got a little bit of flour, a little bit of oil. I spent the first 20 years of my ministry in the South. So I learned a few things about the South. They were making whole cakes. Anybody here know about whole cakes? Praise the God. Got some Southerners in the house. They were making, well, for you Northerners, it was like a biscuit. She, am I right about it? They were making a little uh, biscuit. So the woman is already in a famine, bad times, husband done dead and gone. And he says to her, Elijah, go to that woman. So Elijah shows up and he says to this widow woman, go ahead, make the cake. But after you make it, give it to me. You, you know how you all talk about preachers? Preachers come to your house on Sunday after church and he gets to eat first. And he gets the chicken, the big piece. Well, act like you all don't know what I'll be talking about up in here. He gets, he gets the, 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 the chicken breasts. He, 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 looks at the, he looks at the leg and he pushes it aside. He sees the feet. Some of you all don't know about that. He gets the chicken and he pushes that aside. He sees the chicken neck and he, Ugh. and he goes down deep for the breasts. And then after the preacher has gotten his, then everybody else can come and eat. So Elijah shows up and he says, go ahead and make this little cake, but give it to me first. Now hold on to that. Give it to me. Hold on to that. Hold on to that for a moment. Give it to me first. And she did as the prophet had commanded her. But the Bible says, it didn't stop there. The Bible says, because of her obedience... The cruise of oil and the meal barrel, it never ran. So, Jolie, when you get your bad days, rise up and honor God. Turn your back on the doctors if you want, on the hospital if you want, on the preachers if you want, on your friends if you want, on your family if you want, but never turn your back on God. You, you, you come from good stock. You, 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 your daddy, your daddy is a preacher. Your mom, oh, everybody speaks glowingly of your mom. Jolie, you come from good stock. Don't turn your back on God in spite of what's going on around you. So Elijah shows up from the brook, dried up. He goes to the widow, not the big shot, but the widow's house. And she's faithful. She puts God first by giving him cake. You think the story would have ended there with the woman and her son and a barrel of oil that's flowing and the flower flowing. But nah, it didn't stop there. The Bible says after a while, the son of the house falls sick. I, I like how the Bible says it. The Bible says that there was no breath 
Verse 17 says, 1 Kings 17, 17 says, there was no breath. If I preach this, I'll say, when life knocks the wind out of you. Today, Jolie, life has knocked the wind out of you. You've been busy planning a program. You've been busy putting the program together. You've been busy, busy with the obituary. Busy making plans. Busy shopping. Busy, busy, busy. But then after a while, reality will kick in. What do you do on those days when life knocks the wind out of you? So life knocks the wind out of the sun. And the woman says, why are you coming to my house? To cause my sins to remembrance? Cause my son to die? Elijah says to the widow woman of Zarephath, the same thing he said about the cake. What did he say to the woman with the cake? He says, make it, but do what? Give it to me. Now that the boy is dead, he says to the woman, give me your son. The, wo the woman had been in the habit of giving and trusting God. She gave the last meal that she had. Now it's her son. Life knocked the wind out of the boy. He says, give me your son. And she gave the boy to Elijah. And this is when the story gets good. Down south we say it gets gooder and gooder. Elijah, give me the boy. Elijah takes this little boy. Life has gone from him. He's dead. Lays the boy across the bed. And Elijah stretches himself over the boy three times. One for the father. <laughs> one for the son. One for the Holy Ghost. And the boy came back to life. Cleveland, Jolie, is not dead. Cleveland sleeps. He sleeps. I was thinking about this 34,000 feet up in the air last night. There's a writer by the name of Ellen G. White. And this is what she said. In the garden, when God created man, he called everything else into being. Let there be light. Animals, birds come forth. They were just coming forth. Everything God called. But when God got to man to show you how special and precious we are to God, the God of the universe knelt down before dirt. And he touched the dirt, intimacy. And he formed the man out of the dust of the ground. And the body, the, the dirt was just sitting there. And then God says something else. God says, and then God breathed into man the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So the, so the dirt was just the dirt there by itself. But it took, there was, a, a, you know, cleavers into math. It took a mathematical, equa a mathematical equation. It took the dirt plus the breath. To equal a living, active being. So the dirt is just the dirt on the ground. God knelt down, formed it, and then God breathed into the nostrils of that dirt, that formed shape, the breath of life, and then man became a living soul. So Cleveland is live and well. Six four, six five, six six. Depending upon how good you were feeling that day. And the day that he died, the moment that he died, the same breath that God breathed into his nostrils, the Bible says the breath goes back to God. Today, within the hour, the body will go back to the ground. You'll hear me say these words, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, and dust to dust. So Cleveland is going to return. And by the way, he looks good. When I walked in here today and I saw Cleveland, man, I, 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 I slapped him on the chest. Boy, you're looking good. He does. 
Now I see why you had the casket open. You can get just one look. But when Christ comes again the second time, listen to me. When he comes again the second time, that breath will be reunited with the body. And man, once again, will become that living soul. Last night, thinking about this. And then this morning, don't you know, as I walked out the house, Sister Jean is behind me. I'll see you later, brother. I'll have dinner ready. I said, thank you, sis. I'll be back. And as I stood in the driveway, the walkway, talking to my sister, I saw the leaves fall. And I thought about the Garden of Eden. This is what Ellen G. White says. She says that Adam wept more when he saw the leaf fall. Because he recognized that it was because of his sin that death entered the universe. Adam wept more for a leaf than we weep now for our loved ones who die. The little boy's dead. Elijah lays over the boy, and the boy comes back to life. That is what I call resurrection. I'm longing for the day when Christ comes again the second time. Oh, hallelujah. Praise be his holy name. And you think that Cleveland was tall then? Now? Uh Uh-uh. Jolie, you ain't seen nothing yet. Man's original stature was about 18 feet tall. And the woman was right about his shoulder. Oh, I went to the doctor yesterday and I stood on the scale and he said, oh, Mr. Mounter, you know, you are doing pretty okay. You weigh now over 100 pounds. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. (laughs) Oh, but when the Lord comes again the second time, just like that woman's son was raised back to life, Cleveland is going to be raised back to life. So today, Jolie, I say to you, let not your heart be troubled. Listen, I'm talking to you, my girl. Weeping endures, but joy will come. Let, 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 Let me close with this. We were living right up here uh, in Valley Stream, and then I'd, I'd come out of Valley Stream Boulevard, make a right on Terrace up there by the, U- by the mall, make another right on the Sunrise. And one year for Thanksgiving, our grandchildren were coming home for Thanksgiving. At the time, there were only two of them. It was only Christian and Kaylee, the two eldest grands. My wife and I got in the car, and, and, and I don't know who was in the car last but, but it was on a radio station, I think it was 107.5. I don't know who was in the car last, might have been me, I don't know. But it was on 107.5. And, 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 and I heard the song on the radio. And when I heard the song on the radio, I almost ran off the road. Triggers. You're going to have triggers coming home for Thanksgiving. Not two of them should be coming, but three of them should be coming home. And the song comes on. Just to see her. Just to hold her. If I could have her in my arms, just one more time. And my mind went to my granddaughter. And I almost ran off the road. Triggers. While we lived here, there was one day that I didn't answer my phone. It was September 25th. That was the date of the accident. I was in church that day. We had communion that day. I, was home, I went to visit a man named Brother Reed. I called him Papa Reed. And while I'm at his house, I said, let me check my phone. And I had over 100 messages. And I'm saying, what, is the, what in the world is this? What's going on? And a preacher friend of mine says, Bob, call me. It's serious. This is 4 o'clock in the afternoon. 9 o'clock that morning, there was an accident, and my baby's already dead. 4 o'clock, I'm just finding out. And I says, Ben, what's wrong? And he says, Bob, you got to get here right away. There has been a serious accident. Your son-in-law is in one hospital. 
your daughter is in another hospital, and your grandbaby is in a third hospital, Birmingham Children's Hospital. And my wife and I rushed to the LaGuardia, and I, I entered my, 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 my ATM card to get some money to get a flight. And they kept asking me um, for your pin, and, and I couldn't remember my pin. I'm putting in all kinds of crazy numbers. And then after a while, it says, this, this has been rejected. And the man who took me to the airport, I had to call him. I said, Oscar, I need you. Come back. Come back. I need you. I can't get on the plane. I don't have the money. There are going to be days, Jolie. Your world is going to go upside down. Go upside down. But I heard my grandma sing a song. And I, I, I sing it whenever I go to the hospital. Well, Humphrey, uh, Whitnell, you start in any key and I'll flatten it out. <laughs> uh, you you just, just, just act like I know what I'm doing. But, but, I, but I want you, I go to the hospital and, and I'll go see the, the, the old mothers and, and I'll rub their heads. And I'll sing to them. I'll sing to them. Be not dismayed. Whatever be time, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. Grant, come stand with me, son. G Gabriel, come. Gigi, come up here. God will take care of you come here pastor hold hold one pastor come hold one pastor come hold one of these children or oh, all the way he will take care of you god will take care of you Another voice says, nothing you ask. Listen to me, Joe. I'm just talking to you. Nothing you ask will be denied. Why? God will take care. Stand and sing with me of you. Of God will take care of you oh yes he will god will take care of you god will take care Father, that's my word. I tried my best. And I pray that you will just bless Jolie. Bless Grant. Bless Gabriel. Bless Gigi. Watch over them and keep them, I beg. In your son's name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Jolie, come. We're going to go to the acknowledgments. make some adjustments to the program and um,
Good evening, everyone. God is my refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. When I was in elementary school, I had to learn that. I think I was in the second or third grade. And um, we had to learn passages from the Bible. And as a child, you think, I don't understand why I have to learn all this and memorize it. But now I do. God is my refuge and my strength. I just want to thank you all for being here. Words cannot. My words, I don't have the words to express gratitude for all that you've done. My church family, Lawrence school family, the students, um, my, my biological family, my extended Woods family, um, Ebenezer, the pastors, Bishop Highsmith, I want to say thank you. Um, the Lawrence School District, all the students, I know what you've been doing, and I'm struggling because I don't have my glasses on. Here, what is this? All the families in five towns. I'm, I've been getting so many calls, so many messages, and even though I can't respond to everyone, I've, I've been hearing your support and I feel your love. All in one athletics, Dove. Southern New Hampshire University family, thank you. White Plains Church, my former church family, the Bethesda Junior Academy where my children go to school, and the Bethesda Seventh-day Adventist Church, and all my girlfriends. <laughs> Thank you. You guys have been awesome. But I just ask that you would keep us in your prayers. Don't stop praying for us. Because I know that without God, this will be really dark and dismal. And I know even with God, there will be hard days, but just keep us in your prayers. Pray for my boys, for my baby girl. If it was up to Cleveland, we would be in a basketball court right now. He would want us to party. So I just ask you guys to keep us in your prayer. Keep his memory alive. He had an awesome sense of humor. And I just want to say thank you. I love all of you. I can't call everybody's name because my brain is all over the place. But thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless every one of you and all your families. Thank you. I pray, Pastor Mount, if I may give you a minute or two, I want to make a comment. This is a basketball crowd today. I know ball as a pastor, basketball. I know about Steph Curry, Julius Randle, R.J. Barrett, Zion Williams, the list goes on. I know basketball. This death today is Dr. Oliver. This is halftime. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But one day soon, here come the finals. Yeah. I said today, my friend, this is halftime. But one day soon will be the finals. One day soon, Christ will return, and this game will be over. Can we say amen? amen. I said it will be over, because one day Christ will return. We have the final shot, the three-pointer. Can we say amen? It's all over. Today, my friend, Jolie Day, don't, I know it hurts, right? We buddies from way back in the day. Just believe in God. Trust in God, okay, Jolie, and the children. And you're going to be okay, my dear, okay then? Finally, my friend, before I pray again today, my friend, keep this in mind that Jesus 
has never lost one game in life. All games, he's won them. He's a heavyweight champ of playing ball. Somebody say amen. Come on, folks. Say amen, say amen folks. It's going to win one day coming over. Okay, Jolie, my dear, trust in God, okay? Jerry and your wife, Gail, Crystal Hall, trust in God. Children, trust in God. Members, trust in God. Shall we pray? For you, a God, we know that a God that understands pain and discomfort. You lost your son, Jesus, on a hill far away, on a beat up tree called Calvary. But one day soon, Jesus, this, this Cleveland wood lying in this metal box, but one day hear your voice from the clouds of heaven. One day soon, these children and their mother, one day soon will see Christ one day soon in the clouds of heaven. It's going to be a rough ride for Jolie initially, but let's put our trust in God, the God that gives comfort, the God that knows pain, the God that knows death. And one day soon, Jolie and the children and Gail and Jerry, one day soon, Jesus will come. And this thing called death will meet its match. It will have its own funeral called for Jesus. But they say amen and amen and God bless you. would like for the funeral director to come and give directions as it relates to the cemetery and then I will give you instructions about the recessional.
blessing that will be when we all sing Jesus, we will sing the tenderness. Sing the wondrous of our Jesus, sing His will and His grace. Thank you for all of your support. We're just asking that if you are not immediate family, that you would please exit the sanctuary. If you are not immediate family, please exit the sanctuary. It's important that we get the family to 
the cemetery. It's very important that we get the family through the viewing and get them to the cemetery. Thank you for your cooperation, your support, and your love.